And for Heidegger, this seeming passivity, though this would be uh, perhaps a, the wrong term, this passivity of the, of the self is just as important as every other aspect of it. What's the German word for mood? Uh, Stimmung. Stimmung. And what does that mean? Uh, well, literally? It, it, I mean, doesn't isn't it, it a musical metaphor? Yeah, r tuning, attunement. Attunement, yeah. That's why I, I, I think attunement would probably be a better translation of Stimmung than mood, although yeah. that he, what he really does mean is mood. But to understand yeah, yeah. our moods as a form of a, attunement, I agree with you. That's one of the great insights of being in time, that Dasein is never without its mood, and it's never without an attunement to its world and to others. And I agree with you as well that this is one of the most under-thematized, if, non, if not non-thematized, um, existentiality of, uh, uh, in philosophy. So it's true that, that, that mood comes in. And mood is uh, linked to the body as well in many ways. No? There's, it has a, also a biorhythmical foundation. Yeah, I, I think so. And Heidegger has an understanding of the body, which obviously yes. can't view it as simply an object right. at our disposal or a tool that we use. Okay, so we have Dasein that's al always a being in the world. The, wor right. uh, 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 the world is its Da, or it's there. Dasein right. meaning literally being there. Uh, and therefore, we start from this uh, presupposition that Dasein is always situated. Right. It's never, it doesn't have this Cartesian capacity to be an abstract entity. Well, it's uh, not extractable from It's not extractable. Yeah. It's not, never disembodied, in, in other words. So it's in the world. Uh, we also said that it's temporally ecstatic. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're projected into the future, into possibilities of the future, but we're also thrown into a world, and we're thrown into a world that was there before we got into it, right. that comes with a whole baggage and uh, uh, past, and we find ourselves already in uh, in the world in, in the sense of having inherited. Uh, We're structures. finite, in other words. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, we have a a being that is, as you were saying earlier, always outside of itself in one right. form or another. Right. And this, um, so this temporal structure that Dasein has is finite. That's the, that's the a very important word that you just used there. That yeah. it's a, you could say, uh, to speak Heidegger's language, Dasein is transcendent. It's always self-transcending, but it's finitely tra self-transcending, no? Yeah. What is the importance of finitude in the uh, temporal equation? Well, this touches on a theme I know to be dear to your heart, death. Dasein doesn't have its death, once again. No one has their death. Our death is always ahead of us. And so, in Being in Time, Heidegger speaks about our being towards death. Yeah, what's that mean, being toward death? Well, it means or being unto death, I think was the old, yeah. older translation. We, we don't have death as a possession. When death's there, we're not there. This is a thesis you could find in Epicurus, for example. But what what Heidegger does with this is say that as long as we're alive, something is outstanding. And what is outstanding is death. But death is precisely what is most our own. No one can die in my place. People could teach my classes for me. People can drink my alcohol for me. But no one can die for me. So this is inextricably my own. And yet, paradoxically perhaps, I never have it. I don't possess it. What's most my own is this outstanding possibility. Death. And that yeah. itself is a shattering or an opening of the subject, of mm -hmm. the self, into this world. Yeah, I, I Heidegger calls death the, my own most possibility of being, which is founded upon an impossibility of being, because once you die, you are, you are no more. Dasein's who comes to an end with its biological with this biological death, which I, 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 I don't agree with, by the way. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. I, Heideggerian enough in many respects, but I also don't agree with what he says that you repeated, that no one can die for me. Uh, Someone can die for you? I, well, put it this way. In anthropologically speaking, if you were to ask a... Um, 
I don't mean just someone heroically dying so that I can live on, no. But uh, it's you, if, if you ask a believing Christian whether Christ's death on the cross was not an instance of someone dying, uh, you know, for me, then... then uh, or so that I could live, right. that, or but that part of my rejoining Christ would entail my own death, so that I could rise again. Well, exactly to heaven. So even yes. though Christ dies in my name, perhaps I still have my own life to live, my own death to die. Yes. Well, it depends on how you read uh, someone like Saint Paul, where he, you know he says that Christ died so that we can live. Uh, yeah, anyway, we don't want to get into that. It's not the only. That's not the basis of my. St. Paul died, didn't he? Uh, my skepticism about the fact that no one can die for me is, is, is that, uh, or no one can die in my stead. Someone can die in my stead, I suppose. That um, it makes my death a completely individual uh, event that separates me from others. Uh, isolates me. In fact, Heidegger says that death is that which individuates Dasein radically. No, right. And, and there's different ways of in interpreting these passages and being in time. However, one could say that through this relationship to death, what I lose relationships with with others, but I lose my inauthentic relations with others. I no longer see others as replaceable beings or myself as one just like them. In realizing my own uniqueness, let's say, my own singularity, there's a transformation of the world as well. And so in recognizing myself as an open self, an open subject, I'm actually able to entertain relations with others. I'm already relationally disposed towards them, as opposed to an understanding of the self that would be encapsulated and would have nothing, could have no way of escaping itself in order to communicate with another. Yeah. So I think death is the possibility of being with others. Well, I like it when you say it that way, and I'll go along with that, as long as we can account for the fact that uh, in traditionally, in almost all human cultures, the event of death is one of the most communal, collective, social, uh, ritualized events that bring entire communities together around the mourning rituals and, and so forth. So, Undeniably. Uh, yeah, and this is where one would need to give Heidegger's ontology a little bit of an anthropological supplement. But, but uh, let's keep you know the focus on the uh, on the point, which is that this is astonishing that a philosopher of Heidegger's caliber, because he was already well known by 1927, you know, he comes out with this book, uh, "Being in Time," in which things like uh, my being unto death, my authenticity. He also speaks about the call of conscience, that if Dasein is going to uh, embrace its own authenticity, it's going to have to hear this call of conscience, which he says is coming to me out of the very nullity or nothingness of my being. Uh, and he speaks about anxiety and all these things that had such a resonance yes. for these people, which wasn't that long after World War I, and uh, very, very unusual for, you know, High brow academic philosophy to be talking about these highly yeah. existentially charged exactly. concepts. This is, this is what distinguished it from Husserl's phenomenology in a, in a certain regard. It's it's concrete. It's it's real. It's about life and how we live it. Yeah. Before we move on from being in time, I, I mean, obviously we, we're just scratching the surface. I mean, the text is such a complex one, and I, I, I think that. Yeah, in the question of the meaning of being, the Dasein analysis serves, I think, to uh, uh, emphasize the fact that it's really Dasein's finite transcendence, its temporality, its being projected beyond itself into possibilities, that all this, uh, uh, let's say, these recessive, absential dimensions that surround the moment of presence, past, future, and so forth, possibility instead of reality, that this creates a distance, it gives Dasein a distance from, from the immediate uh, involvement with things and is able to disclose the world or the horizon of intelligibility, give it access to what Heidegger will then call, uh, you know, the being of beings. So it's really through an analysis of Dasein that he, um, that he puts himself on the track to asking that, you know, that fundamental question. No? Right, and uh, one thing I would add is that 
perhaps we speak a little too strongly if we say that Dasein is embedded in the world, because one of the things that Heidegger wants to maintain is that there's also the world itself is composed of differences and distances. His criticism of Nietzsche, of Rilke, and also of Ernst Jünger is that their ideal figures, their ideal uh, subjects are completely a piece of the world. They blend seamlessly into that world, and in so doing, annihilate the world. Yeah. Andrew, uh, after being in time, Heidegger's career uh, takes a so-called turn, or not everyone agrees uh, that there's a Heidegger 1 and Heidegger 2, but clearly something happens in the 30s. He has that moment where he's um, he embraces the National Socialist Movement, becomes the rector of Freiburg University. Uh, 